All right. All right. Good evening. Uh, starting a little bit late this evening. Sorry about that. I had a little trouble with connectivity, but uh, we are live now. If you're here, been waiting on me, go ahead and wave and say hi. We're going to be in Genesis chapter number three. Genesis chapter number three. And uh, we're going to um, talk about the source of so many of our problems today. The source of so many of our problems today, um, something that James refers to as devilish wisdom. We're not going to turn there. We're not going to look at that text specifically, but uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the devil tonight. I've had this outline for quite a few number of weeks, and I've um, been uh, waiting for an opportunity to share it. And so it looks like tonight is the night for that. Genesis chapter number three. I see Carolyn. I see Tanya. And I see Lori. Hey, Lori. Uh, appreciate you saying hi if you're tuning in. And uh, encourages me to know that someone's listening. All right. So Genesis chapter 3. If you're ready, I'm ready. We will begin reading in verse number 1 and read down through. Um, oh, let's see. Well, we'll just see. Verse number one. Now, Genesis chapter three. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, that would be Eve, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he, God, said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman you gave me to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception in pain. You shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. 
Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil, and now let us put, lest he put his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Let's stop right there. Father, we love you. We thank you now. We pray that you'll bless this time together in your word. And use this uh, story for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. So this is a very familiar story. Uh, we've just read it. Um, just quickly uh, summarize it. Um, and I think we're all, most anybody familiar, at least to some degree, with this story. God had put Adam and Eve in a beautiful garden. This shows the goodness of God, the love of God. He gave them a beautiful home, uh, gave um, Eve to Adam. They had a beautiful relationship, a beautiful home, and they walked with God in the cool of the uh, garden, and uh, everything was great, just as God intends for our lives to be when we're um, doing as we ought to do. Uh, he leads us to green pastures, still waters, abundant life. So life was wonderful there in the garden, and uh, then there came the day when the, the serpent, the devil, deceived Eve, and she ate of the fruit of the tree that God had said, among all the trees of the garden you can eat, but not this tree, the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, she ate that fruit, she gave it to her husband, and then chaos uh, more or less ensued, or at least, uh, if not chaos, certainly um, tragedy ensued. The world was fallen. Men and women uh, became fallen creatures. Sin entered God's uh, God's perfect little uh, habitat uh, situation here in the garden. And Adam and Eve were, um, as we read there, punished in uh, various ways and uh, cast out of the garden to till the land from which they came, the ground from which they came, uh, by the sweat of their brow. And so what I want to do tonight is uh, draw some thoughts that uh, uh, have been provoked in me about this story fresh uh, recently and share them with you, okay? And the first one is this, that the devil is sneaky. The devil is sneaky. I just want to make this point very clearly in verse number one of chapter three it says now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field and uh so that's the new king james version the um the uh niv says crafty um i'm trying to remember what the old king james version says there uh subtle i believe um the devil certainly is subtle cunning crafty now, just a guess here, um, I, I suspect that Eve did not even hear the serpent slithering up behind her or whatever the serpent did before it lost its legs, um, but snuck up, I would suggest to you, or at least that's the way um, it plays out in my mind's eye, that kind of all of a sudden Eve is there and, whoa, there's the, the serpent talking to her, the devil, sneaky, cunning crafty. In other places, he's uh, referred to as a lion or a wolf, not just because of his power, but because he's uh, stealthy, if you will, and he is um, sneaky. That's the devil for you, okay? He's sneaky. I want us to think about what that means, that the devil is sneaky. It's not just a name that we call someone, uh, an ugly name, to try to be mean to the devil. It's a fact that the devil is sneaky, and that means something. Paul warns us in Ephesians chapter 6 about the wiles of the devil. So you see, the devil is wily. He's tricky. That means he tricks us. He tricks you. He tricks me, and he's good at it. The devil is a master at the art of deception. And you see, the tricky thing about deception is, by definition, a person does not know when he is deceived. If you know you're deceived, then you're not what? You're not deceived. And so by its very nature, deception is tricky, and um, it, it's, uh, it's a very 
um, precarious thing. And the devil is, um, as we've said, a master at this art of deception. It's not like uh, the Roadrunner Coyote show, you see, where Wild E. Coyote is always trying to trick the Roadrunner, but the Roadrunner is always smarter than the Coyote. I wish that was the case with us and the devil, but it's not always the case with us. And uh, we're often, in fact, not smarter than the devil. And we ought not think ourselves smarter than the devil. In fact, we ought to uh, instead recognize that we are desperately in need of God and his help if we're going to have half a chance at defeating the devil. We ought to uh, acknowledge, understand, know that the devil is tricky. Amen? He's crafty. He's cunning. He cunning. He is wily. So God help us to acknowledge this. In fact, um, Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter number 2, he, he referred to the devil taking people captive uh, and depending on which way that verse translated translates it either is captive to do his will or taking there that he takes people captive at his will almost at will he can take folks captive and he takes them captive certainly to do his will so he's crafty he's tricky okay and i think that plays out here in this story in genesis chapter 3 how tricky he is we'll uh kind of dive into some more of that as we look at uh, each of these other separate similar points all right so the second point is that the devil is always wanting to give us something that we don't need listen friends the devil's always trying to give you something that you don't need do you think that eve needed more than she had really do you she had everything that she needed. You know, the Bible says that God promises to supply us as well with all of our needs, according to riches and glory. That's Philippians chapter uh, 4 and verse number 19. He will supply all of our needs uh, through Christ Jesus. But see, here's the devil. This is what the devil does. He, he try, he's always trying to give us something we don't need, all right? You know, how many of you out there, you've, uh, you've ever experienced this? The devil uh, tricked you, deceived you into thinking you needed something you didn't need more than what you had. And that was the case here. What is it he tried to get Eve to, to take? What did he give Eve, as it were? It was the fruit of this one tree. All right? Did she need that fruit? No, she didn't. She, she had fruit from every other tree in the garden. They had the simple command not to, not to take from this particular tree the knowledge of good and evil. But the text says in verse number six, uh, after the devil put this seed in her, um, it, it says that she looked at the tree and man, it looked like it was good for food, and the gears started turning, and all of a sudden, Eve started to covet the fruit from that tree. And so, um, as we know, eventually, she, she took from the devil what she did not need, and it's the same way today, folks. The devil is always trying to feed you things that you don't need. All right, let me tell you another truth about the devil. Not only is he sneaky, cunning, tricky, and not only is he always wanting to give you something that you don't need, but the devil knows our triggers. He knows our triggers. If you were to turn over to 1 John in chapter 2, you'll see there in uh, along about verse number 16, it says that all that's in the world, it categorizes sin into three categories. It says there's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's all that's in the world. And uh, most any sin that you can imagine will fall under one of those three categories. Lust of the eyes, that is you see something and you want it. All right. Lust of the flesh is this desire to experience something that you think you want, to feel something. And then the pride of life, of course, is this desire to be somebody, to make a name for yourself or to think more of yourself than you ought to think. And many, we all uh, are tempted in all of these three ways. Uh, some of us are tempted more, it seems, in one 
of these three ways than others than the others. In fact, I would encourage you to examine your own life and try to determine which of these three uh, desires seem to be most prominent within you, these propensities toward sin, whether it's the lust of the eyes, which involve covetousness, the materialism, a desire to have and possess, or the lust of the flesh. So many of the lusts of the flesh, uh, we think first generally about sexual sins, um, appetites, laziness, um, um, addictions would fall under drunkenness, would fall under this lust of the flesh, the, the, the desire, the body's desire to um, dictate your life for you. And then the pride of life. Some people are eat up with that. That's their biggest temptation to, they find it hard to humble themselves even uh, before God. And so um, most every sin falls under one of these three um, categories. And we see that right here in Genesis chapter three. Look again at verse number six. The woman saw that the tree was good for food. So she saw this is the lust of the eyes, right? Hey, that looks good, man. That that piece of fruit, wow, it just looks perfect. It's it's ripe. It's ready to pick. It looks like it'd be juicy. Um, and I bet that would really be sweet. And so there's the lust of the eyes. Then there's the lust of the flesh. She said it was good. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasant to the eyes. So um, not only pleasant to the eyes, but um Maybe she was hungry. In fact, I wouldn't doubt. <laughs> and again, we're uh, speculating here a bit. But do you think maybe the devil kind of uh, snuck around and came in behind Eve long about lunchtime or long about supper time, or maybe after um, a long uh, fast through the night before breakfast? He probably caught her during a time when she was hungry. You say, well, you don't know that. And you're right. I don't. I'm simply speculating. But this I do know. The devil is tricky. And so I say it's probably a pretty good guess that he caught her when she was uh, maybe just a little bit hungry. She saw that it was um, good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and then here's that third category, the pride of life. It was desirable to make one wise. Okay, she liked that idea. Hey, yeah, I want to be wise. I want to be like God, which moves us into the next um, the next point I want to make. Here from this passage, not only is the devil sneaky and cunning, and um, not only does he always want to give you something you do not need, and not only does he know our triggers, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. He, in other words, he knows what makes us tick. He knows where our weaknesses are. He knows how to bait us, and that's what he's doing, folks. He's baiting you. Don't give in. Don't go for the cheese. It's a trap. Don't let the devil take you captive at his will or to do his will. It's a trick. And uh, understand that. But then uh, additionally, what we want to see here is that the devil is always telling us half truths. Half truths. You see in verse number five, he had said to Eve, God knows that in the day you eat, of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, is there is this true? Is it true? Is it at least partially true? That's the way the devil does. That's where he gets you. He gets you with part with partial truths. Okay, so is it true in verse number five that the um, that when she, if she would eat this fruit, her eyes would be open? Yes, that's true. Her eyes would be open. Is it true that uh, she would be more like God? Well, in a twisted sort of way, yes, she's more like God in that she understands a little bit more. She knows good, not only just good now, but she, excuse me, she knows evil. And is it true that um, uh, that you would be more like God and that you would know good and evil. Absolutely. You see, up to this point, she only knew good, but from this point forward, she was going to know evil. And isn't it just like the, the tricky devil, the sneaky, crafty, cunning devil to take what is bad and make it sound good? Man, you're going to know more. You'll know good and evil. Well, yeah, I want to know more. Sure, I want to be more like God, if that's possible. And so, the devil fills her ear and her head with these half-truths. 
And that's what he's always doing. And, and another thing the devil's doing all the time, not only feeding us half truths, but he's always misrepresenting God. He's always trying to misrepresent God. And he, uh, again, has this down to art and a science, misrepresenting God. Again, in verse number five, he says, you know, God knows that in the day you eat it, you're going to, um, your eyes are going to be open. You're going to be like God. You're going to know good from evil. He said, you know, what God said isn't true. You're not going to die. Now, did they die? Yes, they did die. They died in two ways. Eventually, they died physically. There would never have been a need to die physically had they not sinned. But because they uh, sinned against God and the wages of sin is death, they would eventually die, and they did, in fact. Many years later, of course, they died and went back to the dust of the earth from which they came. But they died in a, uh, another way, in an even more important way. They they were separated, which is what death is. It is a separation, a de separation from your body, your soul and body. That's how we generally think of death. But a separation from God happened when they disobeyed God, when they came out from under the lordship of God and decided to do things they were uh, commanded not to do and not obey God. There was a spiritual death that occurred there. Their relationship with God from that point on was forever fractured. Uh, it was changed. It was different. And so they had to then be born again. They had to come back to uh, a spiritual vitality with God from that day forward. So uh, this is the devil for you. He's always trying to misrepresent God. And so the most of the world lives under this um, false idea uh, this misconception of who and what God is. Most of the world thinks that um, God uh, is not what he is. He's not the best way. He's not necessarily good for them or that he doesn't love them or he doesn't care about them or he's trying to keep them under his thumb or or whatever. Um, the fact of the matter is, this is the simple fact of the matter, if, that pe if people knew who God was and knew uh, what he was like, they would all come to God. We would all come to God if we could ever really understand God. But people don't understand God, and they buy into the lies and the misconceptions, and the devil's constantly feeding this misrepresented uh, ideas of who and what God is. So um, we've got to be careful, folks. We've got an enemy out there. He's sneaky. He's cunning. He's crafty. He's always wanted to give us something that we don't need. Eve didn't need that fruit. And folks, there's stuff out there you don't need. Leave it alone. Leave her alone. Leave him alone. Leave that alone. Be content with what things you have and be thankful that you've got God. And if you don't got God, get him. Amen? But so the devil's always trying to give you something you don't need. He's always trying to tell you half-truths. He's always misrepresenting God. He knows your triggers. He's baiting you. And then I want you to know this, that the devil leaves you hanging high and dry. That's what the devil does. He leaves you hanging high and dry. And um, you notice in, in the story right here, um, uh, he gets Eve and Adam into this trouble, and he doesn't back them up, you know. He's not backing them up after. In fact, he lured them into this situation to start with. And so the devil will do that. He'll make you think he's going to give you what you want, but he's never going to do that. I mean, he will give you some things that you want, but he's never going to leave you better than you were before you started dealing with the devil. You need to follow hard after God and uh, resist the devil, as James says, so that he will flee from you because he's just going to leave you hanging high and dry. And he's always going to leave you worse off if you buy into his lies, believe his half-truths, um, uh, buy into his misrepresentation of God, uh, give in to the, the um, temptations that he lures you in with. You're going to be worse off, not better. That was clearly the case here. Adam, by the sweat of his brow, you know, he had a gravy job in the garden, you know, it, it, <laughs> the job we all would love to have. Eve, she had a beautiful life in the garden, uh, as we um, can should understand that 
childbirth would have come uh, relatively easy, but uh, that's one of the uh, effects of the sin and the punishment here in Genesis 3, that childbirth would be very difficult, and um, the ground was cursed, and so they were certainly left worse off because of the devil, and that's always going to be the case. And then let me just say, finally, uh, how am I doing on time here? Uh, about 25 some odd minutes in. Um, lastly, let me say this about the devil. The devil can derail our lives, but he cannot separate us from the love and the mercy of God. Certainly he derailed Adam and Eve's lives here. He made a mess. They made a mess by listening to him. And you'll make a mess if you uh, disobey God and give into the temptations and lies of the devil. Don't do it. Don't do it. Young people, don't do it. By the way, young people, I don't get uh, very many or any of you uh, tuning in on our comments here, um, which makes me half inclined to believe that our young people aren't tuning in on Sunday nights. Uh, and I hope that you will. In fact, uh, if you are listening or you listen later, uh, give me a shout out here on Facebook if you don't mind doing that and say, hey, you're here, you're listening. I um, mean, enjoy the message or whatever. Um, I appreciate that. And I want to encourage you young people that this is part of uh, following God. You know, get your ears full and your head full of the word of God and be encouraged in the things of God because the devil's out there and he's constantly throwing things at you. Uh, don't fall for his cunning craftiness. Don't um, take what he's offering. It's a trap. He's always telling you half-truths. Don't believe those half-truths. Don't uh, buy into the misrepresentation that uh, he um, fosters uh, about who God is. But uh, know that he knows your triggers and try to avoid the lies and the temptations of the devil so he doesn't leave you hanging high and dry because he really can derail your life and you don't need that you want to follow hard after god and let god bless you and lead you in a good and a right and an honorable path you're going to make plenty enough mistakes in this life even trying to do right but if you'll try to follow hard after god and you'll seek his face he will help you and he will bless you and he will come to your aid to your side and uh, lead you like a shepherd and love you like a, a kind heavenly father. So in the text here, he certainly derailed Adam and Eve's lives here, but notice he could not separate them from the love or the mercy or the grace of God. Uh, even in their sin, God showed kindness and um, he sacrificed an animal and, and made them animal skin clothes. God sacrificed animals for Adam and Eve for their sin and their nakedness there in the garden, just as he sacrificed his own son on a hill outside of the city of Jerusalem over 2,000 years ago. God loves us, even in our sins, and he paid the ultimate sacrifice at Calvary. He gave himself on the cross, he died for our sins. He paid our sin debt. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He came directly from God, put on flesh, and died on a cross in our place. So that whosoever will believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The devil certainly can derail your life uh by sin if you buy into the lies but the devil cannot separate you from the love of god i would encourage you today wherever you are know that god loves you does he love your sin no does he hate your sin yes is he calling you from your sin yes does your sin separate you from god yes it does your sins have condemned you and one day if you die in your sins you will go to hell because of your sin that separates you from God. But you don't have to die in your sins. If you would receive Christ, his gift of pardon and mercy uh, and, and, and love, he gave himself, he rose again from the grave, and he says, if you will come 
to Christ and trust what he did on the cross of Calvary. By faith, you'll look to Jesus, ask him to save you, believing that he will. Then you will be forgiven and saved because God loves sinners. God loves you. God loves me. If you've never been saved, he wants you to be saved. Now to the saints, let me just say quickly, even in your sin, God loves you. Um, don't, uh, don't go on in sin. I don't believe the Holy Spirit will allow you to do that. I believe he'll chasten you and bring you around like a good father does for his children. But why don't you um, separate from your sin and uh, reconnect in a very fresh way with God so that you know the peace that you ought to know in your heart and your life that you're not really going to know as long as you're living in sin. Don't buy into the lies of the devil, but come running back to God. I hope that's helpful for somebody out there tonight and encouragement to you um, or even maybe establish some conviction in your heart about your need to get right with God. If I can help you in any way, be happy to uh, connect with me. Uh, you folks from Burns, you know how to get a hold of me. Um, you folks online out there, you uh, message me on Messenger and uh, we'll connect and I'll be glad to help you, encourage you any way I can. In the meantime, hang in there and follow hard. Love you. God bless.